here closer. Um, uh, if you have a comment for things, because I call on people, uh, be sure and have your hand raised high when I do ask for that. Um, and we might have to move on a little quicker. I might not be able to get to everybody who has a comment, but I'll try to, uh, to look around for things. Um, there are lessons up here in case you want them. If you like to write, uh, they're great for you that way. There's some pencils up here. They are on the big screen as well, uh, so it's pretty easy, but sometimes people like to write notes. 30 seconds. Come on, Michelle, hobble faster. <laughs> Don't worry, if you miss this week, you can always get it online. And uh, I'll be back again next week, so you'll see me again. Uh, we're going to do this study all the way to Trinity Sunday, which is the end of May. And then we'll start up something new in June and then move forward in the summer with summer months with that. So just to let you know. Uh, let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks and praise this day that you have fed and nourished us, your sheep, that you have connected us once again to the presence of Jesus Christ, our Good Shepherd. And Lord, help us to follow his word and his way and your will. Help us to care for one another and love one another in the flock. It is in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Shepherd and Sheep Part 2. Question for you to ask your neighbor. What do sheep look like and how do they act? This should be fairly simple, but you might be wrong. So talk about it with your neighbor. Go. Give you 30 seconds. This should be an easy question. What do they look like? How do they act? We looked at the shepherd last week. Now we're going to be looking at sheep a little bit more. All right. What do sheep look like? And I'm a collector of sheep. I like little stuffed sheeps and things. I like shepherd paraphernalia kind of stuff. You'll see some today because I'm a shepherd. I'm an under-shepherd. But what do they look like? Everyone seen sheep, real sheep? <laughs> Not just the fuzzy ones. Yes, Bill. <laughs> yeah, if you're looking at them way off in the distance, right? They, they look like little puff balls for things, especially if their wool is still on for that. Um, one thing, where do sheep live usually? Do they live inside in your house and we're on your bed? No, they live where? Outside. And is outside clean or dirty? Dirty. Sheep are dirty. Okay? If you want to know the real pretty sheep, those are 4-H sheep or FFA sheep. Okay? <laughs> those are the ones you're going to have a ribbon for because they want to make them really pretty. If you're having sheep out in your field, they're not so pretty all the time. They're, they've got gunk on them. They've got filth on them. They're animals with stuff. Uh, they're kind of dumb, so they will be attracted to the dirt and the filth, as opposed to just trying to stay away from them. Uh, so that leads us to the next one. How do they act? How do sheep act? Yeah, stubborn. Sheep are stubborn. Oh, man, trying to get them into a trailer, and you're taking them to the fair, and you're like, the sheep just before you just went up, follow the dumb sheep. That's all you needed. You're supposed to follow. And they're like, no, I'm going to do my own thing. I'll be my own flock of one. And they're just stubborn. I had a hand over here. Yes, please. They wander aimlessly. Yeah, they, uh, they kind of take a walk. And usually it's because they're distracted. It's usually because they're hungry or they have a desire for something. But they are herd or flock animals. They're supposed to be. But oftentimes they scatter. That's why you need a sheep dog or a under shepherd or a shepherd to bring them back into the flock. Because they're always doing that. They're always churning. How else do sheep act? Yes, Wayne Beck. They're loud, oh yeah. And the, the, you get one, they're loud. You get more, they're loud. And what's great 
is it's not that they're all independent and like they, oh, well, that one's loud and I'm going to be loud together and we'll make them, make them aware that I'm really hungry. One, per, one of the sheep makes a noise, all the rest will go, okay, we're going to make noise. Look, that's what the sheep do. That's what we'll do. We'll make noise. I'm hungry. Well, I don't know, but the rest of the sheep, they might not be hungry at all. They're just bleeding. That's all it is. It might be because of a predator, but usually it's just because one starts it off and that do it in the middle of the night, like at two in the morning. And you're like, what the heck is going on? Why are they making so much noise? They do. They make noise. So we're going to dig into sheep. Why did God choose sheep? Out of all of the animals that are created on the days of creation, first six days of creation, actually at the last end of it, all these different animals, you know, like noble animals. Why didn't God choose a dolphin? Why didn't God choose an elephant? Why didn't God choose something strong like a tiger or something like that. Right, so we're going to go to the question. Yes? Yeah, yeah. They, there is a connection between the two, uh, us and sheep. Sheep need a shepherd. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You have a need. The need is you need a shepherd. That is an important thing to know. A lot of times we're like, well, we need to eat and we need to have the entertainment. We don't know you need the shepherd. And then the shepherd's going to take care of all of the other stuff that you need with this. Sheep need a shepherd. The next is sheep are the product for the shepherd. And I knew this from coming up in North Dakota, talking about sheep and shepherding, because you always have this idyllic picture where you have these sheep on the hill, and they're so beautiful, and they just do whatever they're supposed to do, and they come in and they throw off all their wool for you, and they're so happy to do it. And you're like, no. They, I was reminded, they're animals. The shepherd's going to take care of them, but the shepherd wants a product from them. Curds from the herd and milk from the flock with fat of lambs, rams of Bashan and goats with the very finest of wheat. Shepherds have sheep for a reason. He wants produce from this. Now, what's the produce that our shepherd wants from us? Hmm. Ever thought of that? Whoa. What's that? Whoa. Wool, okay. All right. So he's going to take your clothes, right? <laughs> no, maybe not that. What's our shepherd? It could think about that. That's something that I think if you look in Scripture... Um, the scripture always has us wanting to be more mature than less mature, and we're supposed to have some fruit. That's an agrarian thing. But from sheep, it'd be the produce of the sheep, the product, uh, the wool, the milk, the meat, the things that we're supposed to be doing because the shepherd does. Now, it's not a burdensome thing. And we'll get to that. The shepherd loves us. He takes care of us. But he wants us to grow. He doesn't want us to be fat and lazy and slothful and die. He doesn't want that. He's, he's got a, a mind uh, thinking about the product. Sheep are important for worship. And all its fat he shall remove as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it on the altar on top of the Lord's food offerings. And the priest shall make atonement for him for the sin which he has committed. And he shall be forgiven. Something to note in Scripture, and a lot of times we don't get this because we're not Old Testament people. They have different types of offerings that they have to give to God to make sure they're in a right relationship with Him, and He sets this up so they understand what is to come in the Messiah and the Savior. Now, they're supposed to do it. It's a law, it's a command. They're supposed to do it, and they have festivals that have different things. We know about Passover a lot, but many times we don't know about the daily service. A priest had to have a sheep on the altar continually, day and night, every day. So that God would say, your sins are atoned for, I forgive you, we're going to look to next day, and then we're going to look to the next week, and we're going to look to the next one, and then we're going to look to Christ, who is the final one. That's what Hebrews talks about with this. Sheep are important, and in fact, if you ever hear about the morning or evening sacrifices, that's a sheep sacrifice because it's supposed to represent God and us. We're supposed to be connected, and it's supposed to have that bell in our mind go, ooh, there's some sheep that's coming that's going to take care of our sin. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, continuing with Psalm 23, why would valleys be dangerous for sheep, and why do they have to go through them? Talk about this with your neighbor. Go.
All right, so why are valleys dangerous for sheep? If you remember, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, so there's death involved with this. So the question is, why would valleys be dangerous for the sheep? Yes? All right, the predators. Just to let you know, predators are usually lazy. Okay? They're lazy animals with things. Now, if you asked a predator or if you had a predator, you say, oh, you're a wolf, what would you rather do? Would you rather climb up the whole mountain, eat the sheep, and then climb all the way back, or would you just stay in the valley when the sheep go through and eat one of the sheep? And the wolves are lazy, and they go, okay, I'll be lazy. Um, that's the same with other predators as well. I had a, another one over. Yes, please. The sheep are busy and distracted with the grass and whatever's going on in the valley, and they're not thinking about what's Yeah. Yeah, and this is a, a really important thing for the shepherd to be aware of. Because when the sheep are distracted, now sometimes they're distracted because of a good thing. They're eating, they're drinking, they're supposed to be going that same way. Sometimes they're distracted because they're sinful. And the shepherd's looking out of this, that valleys are dangerous. Now, so oftentimes when we look at valleys today, we don't think of them as dangerous. Because we don't see the metaphor, we don't see the analogy that's happening with this. Uh, Psalm 23 is a cycle. And it's a sheep cycle in Palestine. And in Palestine, if you know, um, if you are a rancher that actually has to move your herds, you know about this cycle. That you have grass when it's green, and then you move them to another place of green grass, and then you move them to another place of green grass, and then eventually when it turns winter, you bring them back in where they're safe and they're warm and they don't get killed by the elements or things. It's a cycle. This cycle in Palestine is that they would need to go up to better grass when the warmth and the heat would start to kill the lower land grass, and they'd have to go through a valley to get up to the next hill or to the plateau or to the tops of the mountains. Now, their mountains are not like ours. So I always have to tell people they're small mountains, but mountains for them because they're starting at sea level. And they have to take these sheep through this valley where the predators hang out, and they want to eat them. And that's why they have to go through the valley. So the shepherd says, you need to eat. We need to go through this dangerous place, and I will take care of you. Please stick close to the shepherd. Please stick close to the flock so you're not picked off as a straggler. Please don't be distracted. We're going through the valley. We're getting up to the more tablelands where you can be fed and pastured for the remainder of the year before we have to come back through it again. Now, the next question is, what valleys do you face with your shepherd? I want you to talk about that with your neighbor. Go. All right, if you'd like to share a little bit, let's start with small valleys. Because a valley is a dip in your life, and they might not be monumental, what you think, but they're still small valleys that you need your shepherd to help you with. Anybody have any small valleys they want to share? Nobody has small valleys. It's all big. Yes, please. Health. Yes. Yeah, you take it for granted until you don't have it anymore. The small things. Now, this is a hard thing for the sheep as we get older. Our health diminishes. We were not supposed to have bodies that die and decay because of sin, and we see it. Our genetics, our brains, our other things. Be aware that the world, the evil one, tries to pollute you in saying, you're getting better. Is that true? <laughs> Look at history. Are you getting better? <laughs> No, you're, you're not getting better. But that's the evil one, the world and our sinful nature. Oh, you're getting better. You're like, well, maybe we have some advances. Maybe we have some technology. But we're not really getting better if you look at history. Our bodies are falling apart, our health. Other small valleys. Yes? Unemployment. Unemployment, yes. Unemployment. Although that can be a big valley for people the longer you're in it. 
Yeah, the uh, looking for jobs, looking for careers, relying upon the shepherd. I had a, a hand over here, I thought, yes. Yeah, relationships can be very rocky, especially if uh, you're in a relationship with somebody who's a predator. <laughs> they, you know, they're kind of mean people. And you're like, okay, how do I do this? How do I be a sheep? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, did you say straying, kids? Yeah. Yeah, our children who are wandering off, our society who is wandering off, people who are wandering away from the flock, and we don't know what to do or we don't, know, we don't want to do it because we love them or tolerate them or something like that. I'm like, the point is bringing them back to the flock. That's a, that could be little, could be big for many people. Uh, how about some big ones? What are some big valleys we're going through? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the shingles especially. Yeah. The, the crisis of health. And it could be a chronic disease. It could be a mental illness that we're dealing with. It could be heart attacks or going into the ER. We have wonderful medicine and wonderful things that are going on that help us out, but they're a crisis. Even if you have to go in and get a tooth removed, which I had to do a couple weeks ago, um, it's kind of a crisis. You don't like it. It's painful. It's unknowing. You don't know what's going to happen. I had a hand over. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's a big one. The valley of the shadow of death. Death is a big crisis, is a big predator for things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Big environmental changes that we have. I think of anything that causes you to be anxious or worry is the valley. Now, you might have small ones, and your small one might be, you know, well, can I get out of here in time that Pastor Zillinger is not going to be too loud or too long, and I can go do my stuff. That could be a small one. Could be a big one of, what am I going to eat today? I'm anxious. I don't know what's going to happen with it. So there's some huge, and, and it's anxiety. Uh, and it can, anxiety could be over nothing, too, which is really, I mean, you just be anxious because you're anxious. Yes? Oh, yeah, where your mortal life is in danger all the time. Um, where you don't know when the enemy, that's a hard thing. It used to be like enemies would have battle lines. You go, oh, I know who my enemy is, over there, and I'm over here, and we shoot at each other. Now it's like, I don't know who my enemy is. It, it's all guerrilla fighting. It's all terrorist fighting, and the fear of death that comes in. The enemy, and I, I think about this, and this is Martin Luther, to, brings the pulls back a little bit and says... You're going through valleys with the shadow of death. You have an enemy who wants to eat you. Who is that? The devil. Right, he wants to eat you. He's your number one enemy. He does not like you in the flock. He does not like you with the shepherd. He does not like you living. He wants you dead. He wants you in his camp of darkness. And then Martin Luther says, if you know who your enemy is, your big number one, why don't we try to tackle that enemy and then work on the other thing? Because so oftentimes we have people who want to tackle just the anxiety. Anxiety is not bad. We need to tackle that. Or just your health concern. Not bad. We need to do that. But we need to tackle the enemy first and then move to that. Because when your enemy is taken care of, you're like, oh, okay, maybe I'm not as anxious anymore. Maybe my shepherd is with me with his presence. Um, valleys you face with your shepherd. We always do this as sheep. And we're going to talk about some ways that we can overcome or how the shepherd overcomes I will fear no evil. Why is the fear of evil a problem for sheep? Talk about this. Go.
So there's evil in the valley. There's predators, there's our number one enemy, there's all the other things that cause anxiety, things like this. But my question is, why is fear a problem? Yes? Paralysis by analysis. <laughs> yeah, I gotta get all the information possible, and you will never get all the information possible. Uh, but they'll say, oh, I, I, I'm frozen, uh, trying to contemplate what happens. Yes? Yeah, the wolf wants to scatter you. The fear to take over, um, this fight or flight thing of animalism, where we're like, oh, our, 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 our brain in our back says we got to fight or flight. And I'm like, well, that's a brain of an animal. We're a brain of a, one that has the image of God or a broken image of God. We're a little bit different. We should be able to command our fears. We should be able to take control of them. And in fact, if you're in the military, they will work on you for this, to command your fear. Yes, you might be afraid, but do what you're supposed to do. You cannot be frozen. You cannot run away. Yes, and back. Yeah, uh, hearkening the human fear. You're not trusting in God, the first commandment. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things, right? We fear God more than we fear the predator. We fear God more than we fear the anxiety. We fear God more than we fear the darkness. We fear God more than we fear death. Um, that's hard, because us sheep have these fears. Um, what other fear? Why is fear such an issue for sheep? So, yes, way back. Fear is contagious. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you see that with a flock, um, as sheep especially, but for humans as well, that one gets a fear and starts to bleat and starts running around, and all of a sudden, all of them, and they just go, and you're like, what is going on? They're having issues. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is, there's an element of awe, but I, I, I relate with this. The, the word fear is not terror. And so there's a different word for terror. But fear is, I don't want to ever disappoint. For instance, my father, who I love very much, he's with our Lord, I wouldn't hate to have him come into my room and be disappointed with me. I have a fear of I don't want my dad to think of me that way. That's that fear. And it's hard. You're absolutely right. In our day and age, the word fear is a four-letter word. And I'm like, okay, we've got to reclaim this. The right fear is a good fear. And you're right. Awe is part of that. Respect is part of that as well. But fear is a good one. You, you fear it and say, hey, I, I, God is holy, and I'm not. Um, a lot of times Christians, and, and we as Lutherans are a little better at this, but they'll say, well, why do you talk about sin so much? And I'll say, because I fear God. Because he says in his word, he hates sin. He's not going to abide with it. And if I'm coming in with sin, I've got a problem now. I cannot praise him and thank him and do all the things that I'd like to do because i got sin. God, I need to take care of it. And that's why the early church, the apostles, the Christian church, focuses on the big need first and then moves to smaller needs with it. He says, let's get rid of your fear. Let's have your sin forgiven. And now you're a child of God, and you can ask him for anything. Don't be fearful anymore. And you're like, oh, okay, that, that's a new reality for me. Maybe I should have that in a change. Yes? Oh, yes, our trust with this. Um, to say, okay, how, how do I trust the shepherd? And I have this fear. I have this fear of not getting enough to eat. I have this fear of not knowing where I'm going. I have these fears that have it, um, our lack of trust or diminishing of trust. Um, Next question is, how does the shepherd help you when you fear evil? So this is a different one. How does the shepherd help you when you fear evil? Talk about it with your neighbor. Go. So over and over, we have this in God's Word. We have God taking care of our, our primal enemy, Satan, world and even our sinful nature, taking care of that. But my question is, how does he help you when you're fearing it? So fear is a different one. Um, so how does, how does the shepherd help you with this? 
Because we talked about the problems of fear. Paralysis, scattering, all the stuff. How does the shepherd help you? Mm. Yes, please. All right, the word, over and over. Um, for instance, this is just a no-brainer, okay? God, our shepherd, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our shepherd. He wants us, his sheep, because he loves us. If we have a product for him, we want to stick close to him. Why would he let the evil one eat us? doesn't make sense. Basically, when you're fearful, you're basically saying, well, I don't think the shepherd can do it. You're like, what? The shepherd can do it. And he reminds us in his word, yes, I do it, yes. And he has to, because we sheep are kind of dumb, and we are distracted with things. Others, uh, how does he help us? I had another hand. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't make us face it alone. It's not just the sheep against the world. First off, it's the shepherd against it. He says, hey, I got, it. I got this. And then he says, I'm going to give you even one better. I'm going to gather you together with people who are of like mind and like abilities and like animals, sheep, and so you can be in one flock together. And you can be safe in your numbers. And you can take care of each other, and I can take care of you too. We got it all set. Yes? Pardon? Oh, yeah. The Holy Spirit. That's the word, the comforter. And really that comforter is about... I'm going to be with you and remind you until Jesus returns. That's what that paraclete is about, that comforting word. That not just like, okay, it's going to be all right. That's kind of soft. This is more of, it's going to be okay because Jesus is coming. It's going to be okay because Jesus has died for you. It's going to be okay because you're in the flock. It's going to be okay because your shepherd is here and he reminds us of God's word over and over. Sometimes he reminds us when we're outside of the flock and that comforter says, you need to know where your comfort is at because you're outside. You're anxious. You have fear. You have all these issues. Come on, let's bring you back. Let's do this. All right, I had another hand. Yes, please. He's already conquered. Yeah. Yeah, he's already taken care of our worst enemy. And in fact, uh, it's a, I'll call it a pro and a con just a little bit. One is your enemy's taken care of. You have nothing to fear. The bad thing is, is your enemy hates you because of it. And so our shepherd says the way to combat that is get closer to me. The way to combat that is be in the flock because your enemy hates you. He's prowling around like a lion. He wants to eat you because you're a part of God's kingdom. He doesn't care so much about the rest of the people that are in his back pocket. He cares about you, but don't worry. I've conquered the world. This is Jesus and John, folks. This is what he's saying to his disciples who are very anxious that he's going to leave because he told them that. I had another hand. Yes. Oh. Yes, yeah. Uh, John talks about this, suffering and evil. And the first thing is, and I tell Christians this, your shepherd, your Lord and Master, said you will suffer because you're a Christian. It's a fact. Okay? Take up your cross and follow me. Okay? He said that. So if a person comes in and says, I'm a Christian and everything's so happy for me and wonderful, you're like, you might want to help them <laughs> because they're going to get to a ledge sometime and really get hurt to say, we got a problem with that. So John talks a little bit about there's two different types of suffering. There's the suffering of your own stupidity. And I always warn people. I said, is your suffering because you were sinful and dumb? If it is, repent, turn back to God, have him try to fix it. Now, sometimes it might not be back the way it was. That's okay. But you're with God. He says, repent, turn back. That's a good thing. That's a lot of us. And I, I talk to sheep a lot. A lot of people are like, why is my car broken and out of gas? I said, did you put gas in it? Well, no, God should just put gas in there for me. I'm like, no, that's because you sinned, you omitted, you committed, now you need to repent and do this. This is our whole lives of this. Then there's the reverse, and then John talks about this with suffering, of the world puts upon you. That's the suffering of, I'm doing what God wants me to do. I'm living this life. I am speaking out. I'm using the gospel. I am one of his child, his children, and everybody hates me. You're like, okay, that's a different kind of suffering. And God talks about that too. He says, okay, Jesus Christ has overcome the world. Don't let the world scare you. Be fearful of it. Those are the two different types of sufferings. And a lot of times we think it's all one or the other, or we negate one. And I said, well, get rid of the first one first. That's easy. Repent, come back, be turned. This is wonderful. The second one's a little harder, but the way to combat that is better. Don't be by yourself. Oh, I've seen Christians who are being persecuted by the world, and their answer is this. 
I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'm not going to go to Bible study. My life is miserable. I'm like, do you realize your choices are causing you, your life, to be miserable? You want to be back with the sheep. You want to be with people who care about you. You want to love them and be loved by them. As Hebrews talks about this. And so it's a wonderful thing. God gives us the body of Christ to say, hey, this is a way we can serve one another. We can be protected from the world. And when one of us gets picked off or hurt or harmed, we can say we're going to love and care for them. Um, it's hard because oftentimes people think of a church not as a family or as people. They think of church as a business or like a Walmart. And I'm like, Walmart doesn't care so much about you. Maybe the person who greets you. But they're just wanting you to go in and out and buy something. A church is in your business a little bit. Uh, I have a Christian friend who is always upset. They said, I don't like Lutheran churches that much because I sit down and everybody wants to know my business. And I'm like, because they're caring for you. Now, hopefully they're doing it in a loving manner, but they, they care about you. How are you doing? What can we do to help? How is your family? This is what our family is like. And our world today doesn't know what family is like anymore. It's been broken so much. So we have to be the display for the family. Um, all right, next question, um, or going on. For you are with me. This is one of the reasons or ways the shepherd takes care of the sheep. Notice how the psalm will go through a cycle, but also goes in answering its question. Yeah, the sheep go, oh, how does this happen? Well, you, for you are with me. How is the shepherd's presence a blessing for the sheep? Talk about that with your friends. Go. All right, so just talking about sheep first. So just sheep, we're going to relate it to us just a little bit. But just for sheep, how is a presence or a shepherd's presence a blessing? Way in back, yes. What's that? Guidance, Guidance yeah. You know where to go. Um, oftentimes sheep, you know, like when we look at us, we want to go somewhere. And then the shepherd goes, we're going this way. And we're like, yeah, I don't like it. That's why we get lost. We wander around. But yeah, guidance. The shepherd knows. He can see. He can see ahead. He can see behind. All right, what else? Presence for the sheep. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, once again, you go back to, if the shepherd has this care for the sheep. Now, what's awesome is when we get to the good shepherd, he talks about loving the sheep. That's, that's like huge. Normal shepherds, you go, shepherds want to take care of their sheep because it's produce for them. They, they have a product that they want to take care of. They don't want it to be lost. It's part of a family thing. And um, the sheep um, have to be close. The shepherd has to be close. They have to care for them, the presence for them, to take care of it and say, this is important. You don't have anything to worry about if you're a sheep. If your shepherd is present, you're taken care of. You've got it all because he's taking care of it. Yes? Yes. Protection, we're going to get to that. Some tools of protection and things that the shepherd protects us from our enemies and our anxieties. And, and I think about this. The farther you are away from the shepherd, the more anxious you are. The closest, closer you are to the shepherd in his presence, the less anxious you are. Now you'll still have a little bit of anxiety. But I always talk about people who are struggling, like in marriage or in their families and stuff, and they'll go through therapy, they'll do things, some nice things, and I'll say, one thing you could do is get closer to Christ. Because if you're closer to Christ, you're closer with each other. Because that's a herd or a flock dynamic. That's how that works. Uh, how else? Shepherd's blessing. We'll maybe go to the next one. Yes? Oh, yeah. Our shepherd especially. But a personal relationship, even a shepherd who just has a plain sheep and knows them very well, knows the kind of sheep they are, wants to regard them and steer them close and do this, there's a relationship that is involved. Uh, the next one, let me get to the next one. How is the shepherd present for you? So we're going to talk about us now. Look at shepherd's presence with the sheep. Now we're going to look at how is the shepherd present for you because that'll help solve our problems. Talk about it with your neighbor. Go.
us as Lutherans, this should be kind of a no-brainer. There is the, the static, or the ones that are very um, objective, and then there's some subjective that we'll get to this. Uh, Bill, you had one? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Paul. Once you become a child of God, once you are a child of God, once you are a sheep in the fold, once you're by your shepherd, what can be a harm against you? Nothing can. No one can be against you because the person who's for you, God, our Heavenly Father through Christ Jesus, is in your court. So you don't have to be fearful, although we have any anxieties and things. But uh, how is the shepherd present for us today? Yes, communion! This is my body, this is my blood, I'm right here, come hide with me. Come get close to me. Come be right next to me. Because I want to be present for you. In what he says. Now this is objective stuff. Not subjective. This is not like, well, if I believe it in my heart, then he's there. No. It's like the disciples in the upper room saying, well, if I believe it in my heart, then Jesus is really present with us. They're like, no, I'm right here. Touch me. See me. Listen to me. I'm present. This is why Christians and Lutherans kind of harp on communion a lot. Because he's present. Our shepherd's here. Why do we bow at the altar? Because our shepherd's here. We want to be close to him. We don't want to be far away from him because the more we rely upon ourselves, the more our sheep rely upon ourselves, we wander off. And it's a bad thing. So he's present. All right, I had another hand. Way in back. Yes, please. Thanks, Vern. The Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Holy Spirit and an objective one, too. And I tell people this. People will say, well... I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. I said, hey, were you baptized? And go, yeah. The Holy Spirit was here. Well, I don't, yeah, you can know, because he said so. Trust the word, trust what he says. Not what our hearts feel, not what we think, not what the world feels, but the Holy Spirit is there. I'll leave you the comforter. I leave you my presence in the Spirit. Now, a little different than Jesus Christ's presence, because he's a member of the Trinity. A little different, but that's okay. To say he's present with that. Uh, others, yes. Yeah, yeah, two or three are gathered. We got more than two or three here. Okay, that's great. We got a flock, we got a big flock, that's wonderful. Where we're gathered, where we help each other, where we have God's presence in Christ. And it's not just some metaphorical thing, because I always tell people it's not just subjective. Now, there are some subjective things. We might get to that. There are some things where we say, personally, he has affected me based on his objective stuff. That's all very good. And, and it's, it's valid because it's based on its objectivity. But a lot of times people start with the subjectivity and they start thinking about their feelings and their thoughts and stuff. I said, no, no, go to the presence first, where he's at, and then move to that. Yes, girl. Bible. Word is my presence. This is something that's really big, and I want to say um, the difference between Lutherans and other branches of Christianity, and I kind of sum it up with this. Roman Catholicism at the time of Luther and even today will say the church trumps the word. So if you vote in the church, or the pontiff, the pope says, or if the cardinals say, they can counteract what the word says. Okay? And Luther's like, no, here I stand, God's word. God's word says it's important. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, great. Then there's the Reformed. That's the non denom that's Methodist, Episcopalian, uh, Anglican, all the other ones. They will say reason has to trump the word. That's why when we get to the discussion of Jesus says... This is my body, this is my blood. Word. I don't understand how it works, but he said it. I'm good with it. All right. They will say, you have to understand it. And it can't really mean this, it has to mean this. And it has to mean what you want or this. And I said, that's reason for this. Martin Luther's like, hammer, 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 word, word, word. Because if you have the word, you know it's true. You know what the shepherd says. You know what God says for you. You can bank on it. Even if the devil were to stand up in church and say, I think that's a lie, you say, God says it's true. I don't care what you say, and I don't care what the world says. I care what God says, and if God says it's true, good enough for me. And that's what he says with our salvation. That's what he says with our life in Christ. Wonderful things. Uh, other hands here, present for us. Uh, yes, in back. go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's here, uh, although uh, I was just thinking today in our worship service as I, we go through the liturgy, there's some parts of the liturgy that talk about his omniscience and his om omnipresence and his omnipotence. And oftentimes um, we, we have two false claims of I can run away from God. 
you can't run away from God, okay? So he's always there, he always knows, he knows what's going on with this. And uh, the other one is he doesn't care. I'm like, yeah, he does. Sometimes you are away from God, and he knows where you're at and what you're doing, and he cares. And so he might remove some of his blessing from you and say, you, you got to struggle with this, because I don't want you to be this other person and outside of my flock. I want you to be inside the flock. Um, we talked about objective. Let's go to subjective. How does the Lord's present for you? Any subjective ones that you have other than the, I mean, we talked about the big objective ones. How is he present for you? Yes, Wayne back. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, active relationships, I, I keep an ear open when you're talking with other Christians because the Lord's words are in those too. Because you're part of the body of Christ and his spirit is with them, so pay attention. That's one of the things I talk to a young pastors who are getting their first call and struggling with it. And they're like, well, I'm, what from God? How can I know this is from God? I see this church and they're calling me and what's going on with it? And I said, have you listened to the other members of the congregation, yours and theirs? Because God is speaking through them too. Listen to them. You'll pay attention. And, and usually my rule of thumb, it, it, it works out really well. You can say, oh, yeah, this is not it. Or, yeah, this is it. Uh, because the people are talking in that. And it's not about themselves. It's talking about from the body of Christ. Others? Yes, Yeah, assurance. I'm assured. I'm confident in Christ. I'm assured that this is going to work out because my Savior has done everything for me. And there's, you mentioned the other word, fruit. There are fruits of the Holy Spirit, too, that come about. And I, and I, I say to people, I said, just because somebody seems loving doesn't mean they have the Holy Spirit. Okay, cart and horse kind of thing. Because a lot of people are like, ooh, that person's kind. They must be a Christian. I'm like, no. Kindness is not a prerequisite of Christianity. It's a fruit of the fruit of the Spirit. If you have the Spirit, then you are doing it. Now, if you're a Christian and you're not doing these things, then I ask the question, what's going on? But it's a fruit of. You can see it. it it's produce. Paul talks about that. That's a big one with this. All right, on to the next one. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I brought show and tell today. This says, the Reverend Gregory Zillinger, ordained July 23rd, 2000. This was my ordination staff, as I'm an under-shepherd, okay? Just to let you know, if you know anything about sheep, it's not really a shepherd's staff. What kind of thing is this, if you know? If you go down to Murdoch's or something like this, you, you, if you go, hey, I'd like to have a staff, now if, the, if they know what you're talking about, they'll lead you to this, but this is a pig cane, okay? Just to let you know. Uh, shepherd's crook is usually a little taller, has a bigger crook in it, and it's designed to reach down and pick up a sheep who is in a ditch somewhere and get them. This is a little small for it, but this is the only one we can get. I mean, usually people don't use shepherd's crooks for it. So the symbology is here. This is a staff. This, I am proud to say, I got recently from some members of Shepherd who went over to Ireland. This is a rod. This is a shillelagh. So if you know what a shillelagh rod is... It's, they have sheep over there. They know what to do with rods. So we're going to look at the rod and the staff. Um, they comfort me, both of them, with that. We'll move to the... How does a shepherd use his rod and staff? I want you to answer this two ways. For sheep of the flock, and maybe as for me, an under-shepherd or another shepherd. Talk to your neighbor. Go. <coughs> All right, so how does a shepherd use these implements? We, we have to understand it and understand what Psalm 23 is about and what shepherds do with it. But any ideas or thoughts with these? Yes? Oh, hold, hold on just a second. Well, I'll get you a second. The staff is 
Okay? Right. You might you might nudge them a little bit with it, but you won't yep. Right. Yeah, very good. All right, so Rod. Yeah, you don't. Uh, if it's bigger than that, it's harder with things. This is a the, a rod is like a club, uh, for things. And usually because and this is the same principle of using a bat. Uh, bats are the same shi size and and things because you get the most power with it. And so that's kind of the same thing. It's a leverage issue. If it gets a little bit longer, you don't you lose your power and you lose your your strength with it. All right, I had one here. Yes. The staff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like when they're going the different direction or they're trying to split or something, you're bringing them back with it. Uh, yes, Bill. Oh, uh, with that, he actually used the rod for it. Because uh, the staff has some specific functions for things. One, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a thing of office. You can always tell a shepherd by their staff. You know who they are. Usually, it would stay away from them because they smell. So they'd walk in, and you see a guy with a big crook, and you go, that's a shepherd. I don't want to hang around them because they smell. Um, that's, they were stinky. I mean, even Pharaoh realized this. He's like, oh, yeah, we're all shepherds for this. They're like, you go live in a different country. That sounds good. I'll, I'll provide for you. You get this district for things. Uh, yes, please. Oh. Oh, yes. As kind of a presence kind of thing, some weight that they might have with it. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There is an element of law and gospel. We'll kind of get to that, kind of a, a bigger metaphor with things. Uh, yes, Wayne back, Ara. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So some things about shepherd staff. First thing is sheep are very um, oral or olfactory. They, they smell, but they use smell to know things. And if you're ever with animals, especially around cows or sheep or something like that, and you're a stranger, they will know you by your smell. And one of the things that a shepherd's crook can and does use, is he uses it for, is it gives enough distance that when a ewe is lambing, they can set the, the lamb out, if it's in distress or something, without getting their smell on it. Because if they get their smell on the lamb, the ewe will not take the lamb because it smells different. So he uses that some distancing for birthing for things. Uh, a rod, this is for enemies primarily. Now you might tap a sheep with it, but a shepherd would never hit a sheep. Why? That's their product. That would be dumb. It's like you saying, hey, I have a brand new car, I'm going to go beat on it. You, you don't do that because you can't sell it for things. You, you don't want to hurt your sheep. This is primarily for the enemies for things, but it also is used as a curry comb, um, if you know what that is for animals, of checking their wool for parasites. So the shepherd would drag the rod across their back, which is comfortable. If you have, I have two dachshunds at home, you drag something across their back, they like it. It makes them itch and things. But then you can see if they've got ticks, if they've got mites, they've got these weird stuff that's going on, if they've got wounds that you need to dress or heal. That's how a shepherd would do it. He's very intimate with his sheep with these things. And metaphorically, bigger, law and gospel. Um, the, the word of God for us, comforting us. And that moves us to the next question is, how does a shepherd comfort us with the rod and the staff? Talk about it with your neighbor briefly. Go. Comfort.
So we talked a little bit about maybe like a weight of the staff or the rod doing some comfort with this, but how do they comfort us? How do they comfort us as sheep, not just sheep in a herd or a flock? How does his rod and his staff comfort us? Mm -hmm. How does maybe if you break it out, how does his law and his gospel or his word comfort us? So thanks. Yes, you had your hand? Yeah. Yeah. There is a comfort in the commandments. Now, the bad thing is what we've done is we have made it moralistic like the Pharisees. If you do these things, then you're a good person and God will give you a cookie. No. It is, I have broken these things. I need a Savior. Look, I have a wonderful Savior. Would you not do this again? That's what a Christian's life is like. It is a comfort because the, they give boundaries. Dr. Dobson wrote books on boundaries. Boundaries are a good thing. They give boundaries to the sheep. Um, they comfort us. The gospel comforts us. Hopefully, you're comforted by the gospel. That's my Savior. That's the presence I have. That's I'm close to Him. This is wonderful. Uh, others, how do they comfort us? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, that it's, they're, they're tools to have the sheep be protected and move in a certain way to where the shepherd wants to go. He's not just using his bare hands. He could, but he has tools for it, and it's a sheep analogy that people go, oh yeah, I know how they use it for sheep, and then it's an us analogy. Oh yeah, this is how the shepherd uses it for us. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. What is a table for sheep, and how are they protected? Talk about it briefly with your neighbor. Go. All right, for sheep, what is a table land? Do you know what table land is? Have you ever heard that? What's that? A mesa. Yeah, table land with pasture on it, right? And it's a good place for the sheep to be, although we know the enemy's around. One, he's lazy. Yeah, okay, I get that. He's trying in the valleys. But then he's still hungry. He's going to go follow them around. This table land, they're prepared. It's a place that they're going to go to and be taken care of by the shepherd. And he's going to ward away the enemies by his presence, by what he does, by his very vigilance, by his rod and his staff, because they give comfort to the sheep, because the sheep looks up and says, look, there's my shepherd. He's stronger than those wolves. He's stronger than that bear. He's stronger than that. I trust my shepherd. Um, what are your enemies? And how does the shepherd's table help you? Talk about that briefly. Go. should maybe say, who are your enemies? So yeah, I'm listening here. Okay, so we talked a little bit about enemies already. Satan, the world, our sinful nature that try to eat us from the inside out, from the outside in for things. And then the shepherd's table and his presence help us with this. And hopefully you see the play on words. That's why we call this a table. Right? It's a table not only you eat on, but it's a table where the sheep are fed and taken care of and their enemies are warded off because Jesus says, I've taken care of death for you. And you have my very body and blood in you from the inside out, resurrecting you at the moment and making you different. And you're protected from your enemies. So the devil, he has no claim on you. Your sinful nature is squashed and destroyed. The world is outside the door because it's not in here. It's not where Christ is at because he's conquered the world. Um, you anoint my head with oil. Let me get to the next one. Why would you anoint sheep and in what ways are you anointed by the shepherd? Talk about that with your neighbor. Go. Why would you anoint sheep and how are you anointed? Go. Uh 
All right, one of the things for sheep that you have, anyone heard of sheep dip? What is sheep dip? Yep, you put it, usually sometimes it's a trough, sometimes they walk through something like that, they get anointed. You anoint your sheep. They take care of all the bugs and all the problems that they're going to have with their wool and their skin and things like that. That's how you anoint a sheep. You wouldn't like take an individual lamb unless you only own one lamb. And you do it uh, usually in mass, but you make sure they're anointed. And then the next question is, how are you anointed to take care of your bugs and your wounds and all your stuff? Baptism, yeah, Holy Spirit. <laughs> You've been anointed. You've been given a covering. And that's one of the reasons why we want to keep going back to the covering, because oftentimes we escape from the covering because we don't want to be in line. We don't want to do what the shepherd does, but we, the Holy Spirit, to anoint you, to say this is who you are. You are a new person. You have health and healing. You have the Spirit inside of you. You have the Word and sacrament. You have all these things for you that are good. My cup overflows. How are sheep overabundantly blessed by the shepherd? And how are you overabundantly blessed? This is my cup overflows. It's not a cup of, of sacrifice or hurt. It's a cup of blessing because that's what the context has. So how does he overabundantly bless you? Talk to your neighbor. Give two examples. Go. All right, so we're gonna, I'm going to ask for one of the sheep. How does the shepherd overabundantly take care of the sheep or grace the sheep? What's that? Sheep. Sheep first. How does the shepherd overabundantly do for the sheep? What's that? Provides everything. Okay, this is an amazing thing. One is if you're a regular sheep and you're being protected by the shepherd, you know you might get eaten. Okay, that's what sheep are for. Our shepherd overabundantly says, not only am I going to take care of you, I'm not going to eat you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to love you. Uh, how about us now? Can we have one example of how he overabundantly blesses us? Okay, he, <laughs> that's, that's a huge analogy, and that's where Jesus comes in and says, hey, you all know about David. You all know about him being a shepherd. You know what shepherds are like, and everyone's nodding their head. The good shepherd dies for his sheep, and they all go, whoa, no. Huh? What is that about? That the good shepherd would die. He would overabundantly bless us. And so oftentimes we think about Christianity is all about the things or the blessings that are that's second and third. Those are okay. But you have the shepherd. You have his death and resurrection. You have everything else. You have everything that's good. Uh, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Why do goodness and mercy follow the sheep and why, how does it follow in your lives? Talk about that briefly. Go. Goodness and mercy following the sheep and following you. So in Palestinian era of following the sheep, this is weird, because you think that goodness and mercy will be prepared for the sheep, right? This is not. This is following after the sheep. But in Palestinian area, if you have a good shepherd and a good flock, it is a communal thing for your community. It follows that your community will be good and be prosperous, and your town grows, and your people will be connected with you. That's how they thought. So if you have good shepherd and good sheep, goodness and mercy, all the good things are going to follow. They're going to follow after this thing. Yes? Yeah, yeah, the good shepherd being the same way. So thinking about us, you might, this might blow your mind. Do you realize you sanctify your neighborhood and you sanctify businesses you go to? So, for instance, 
I am a Christian, I have the Holy Spirit. I go into 7-Eleven every day to get gas or get my food, right? They are not Christian. I'm bringing God to them. They are becoming a sanctified place by my presence and my words and my action. Now think about that so you don't act like the world, okay? (laughs) But think about that to say, wait a second, I'm being goodness and mercy to the world. I am showing them who Christ is. I'm bringing up in everything that I do. I'm causing a space to be different out in the world that is corrupted by evil. Now I'm bringing this stuff from the shepherd because they are following my actions. Now that's what we're supposed to do. Oftentimes we sin, I get that. But we're supposed to be that to the world. We're supposed to be that light. We're supposed to be that difference. And it's interesting, people in your community know you. And they will say, I think I know you're a Christian. You go, why is that? Because of this, this, and this. You're like, oh, interesting. Or they'll say, you're a Christian? And you go, oh, maybe I need to work on that a little bit more. (laughs) All right, we're going to get finished up here, keeping track of your time. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So this is the ending. Why would the shepherd's house be the best blessing for the sheep? And why is the shepherd's house the best blessing for us? Talk about that now. Go. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, to kind of wrap things up with the psalm and this part of the sheep, there's a cycle, and the cycle is you start down and you move up to the tablelands, and then you come back to the winter and winter into the shepherd's house, and then you do the same thing over again. But in the psalm, it talks about you end up at the shepherd's house and you stay there because it's forever. You're like, ooh, I'm here. Why is that a good thing? Why is it a good thing for the sheep? Why is it a good thing for us? Yes. Yeah, okay, the shepherd's there. It's his house. Okay, that's good. And I want to be in God's house. Yes. Yeah, no enemies. Now, this is not just talking about when you die or on the last day, although you can apply it. But it's talking about you're with the shepherd, you're in his presence. This is the sheep cycle, but you get ending up in the Lord's house. And what sheep would do with this is in the winter months, you would bring the animals into a building. Farmers do this all the time, especially in hard winters, to take care of them and to feed them and nurture them and do that. And oftentimes, if you have a small flock, they'd be like pets to you because they'd be in the bottom basement of your house providing warmth for the rest of your house, but then they'd stay there forever. That's the... That's the kicker. You're like, whoa, I get to stay with the shepherd in his house forever. How's it a blessing for us then? Yes. Yeah. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Don't worry about things. The shepherd's taking care of you. You're protected by the house. You're in your dad's house. And you should hear some echoes of why we want to go to church. So oftentimes people will come in and say, I want to go to church because of X reason. Now, it's not terrible, but you might want to steer them in a different direction because they're not going to the Lord's house because it's my dad's house and I'm safe there. I hardly ever hear that. What they say is, well, I go to this house because it's got great music. I'm like, that's good. I'm glad it has great music. But is your shepherd there? Is the flock there? I go to this house because of X. I'm like, then the next question is, do you leave the house because of music or because of youth or because of coffee or because of donuts or because of X? I'm like, no, your dad lives there. This is your father's house. This is the flock that he has granted you. This is the sheep, your brothers and sisters. This is a safe place. Why would you not want to go here? To be here forever and to transition when you die and transition when Jesus Christ comes back. To be in the father's house. This is a big stuff that Jesus talks a lot about. All right, we are a little over our time, but if anyone has any comments or questions, they may raise their hand now. Got one right there. Go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, there's, there's the, uh, the metaphor and the example with this, and this is one of the reasons why people will joke and say, well, my body's a temple. And they're like, well, yeah, if you have the Holy Spirit in it, it is. Uh, but a lot of times what happens is, is people will say, well, my body's the, a temple of the Holy Spirit, now I go do whatever I want. I'm like, well, no, you're the temple in God's house, in God's flock. I mean, it's that whole metaphor. 
God wants to live in you, with you, and around you. He wants the whole package for stuff. Uh, others, any comments or questions? Oh, you all know it very well. All right. <laughs> okay, as the sheep of God, let us pray the prayer that our, fa- our Lord and Savior has given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you very much for your comments and questions. We'll see you back next week. And if you got more, you can always email me, too. So.